Welcome to Complexity Medicine, Align and Design. Align and Design is an interactive group discourse, discussion, and dialogue whereby we seek to mutually explore and create a shared pattern language and an implied design thinking process as it relates to health design, leadership, implementation, and integration. Join us as we seek to understand and apply primary patterns and first principles of engagement in the development of systems of care, connection, as well as means towards physiological and ecological well-being at scale. I am artist Andy McClure, and this is Dr. William Sutherland, your hosts. So I'm going to swing it over to Andy to open us up today for week three of our Align and Design, Health Design and Pattern Language endeavor as we're uh, looking to, uh, um, as we're looking to uh, understand more about health uh, together as a community working through this. So Andy, I'll swing it over to you. I to see Catherine there. Hello, Catherine. Just give you a quick hello just as we're starting. Hello. Yeah. Hey, Catherine. All right, Andy. Take us away. Okay. Give us the opening today. Hey, guys. Um, so glad you're back and good to see you again. And um, I'm glad you're here to continue the conversation. Um, I was just doing a little uh, uh, as smudging earlier on, and I thought, uh, I don't know if you've been having a stressful week or not, but uh, if you have, then uh, maybe a little. Uh, of this will <laughs> make you feel better. Nice to start off a little bit with a little reminder just to relax, <laughs> let loose, let go, hold on to those things that are holding on too tight. Um, I want to talk about uh, questions. We um, I guess in the, in the first week, we, we started with the question of uh, what is health? And in the second week, we, we started talking a little bit about patterns and, and the idea of a pattern language. And one of the things that came up in the, in the second week was after uh, our conversations, uh, Bill and I were talking uh, sort of, you know, as we normally do afterwards and, and was asking, you know, about um, some of the questions that that were asked, uh, either uh, overtly or just in the course of, uh, of telling stories. And uh, I think uh, maybe it was Catherine was uh, was talking about, uh, you know, uh, program choices and decisions and things coming up in the future and 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 uh, um, directions. And we were sort of talking about the, the idea of good questions and what good questions um, look like and, and how they sound. Mm -hmm. And it's a really important, um, a, a really important idea. Um, we, we tend to think of uh, questions as being, um, you know, there's some, uh, uh, you know, presumptions that we have before we, we ask them, we, we tend to think that there's answers uh, at the end of them. And we tend to think generally that the the question is is going to is going to lead um, to some uh, completion. Uh, that there's some process that's underway, and that that's going to lead to some kind of completion. And generally, we think of questions as being kind of narrowing. Um, the more questions I ask, uh, the closer I come to the answer that I'm I'm looking for, and that the process sort of gets smaller and smaller. I think diagnostically you know that that's sort of what happens in a in the doctor's office ask a bunch of questions to try to narrow the you know, diagnosis down to get to the to the problem so that the problem can be addressed or the answer found right that's that's that tends to be the way it is and um it works a little differently in an art classroom and i just sort of sort of want to talk a little bit about the process of the way it works again in an art room and why is an art room relevant to this well Again, an art room is really a place where we um, uh, we take patterns 
the elements of, uh, of art and arrange them in different ways to create new compositions. And just like and we take letters and arrange them into words and arrange those words into sentences and, and those sentences become the questions that we're asking there, the compositions. Really good compositions in an art room do something um, that are different uh, than um, coming up with answers. They, they create processes just by the nature of the question themselves. So in a, in a, in a typical classroom, I might ask uh, the students, um, for instance, to uh, paint a self-portrait. That might be the beginning of my, the, uh, the assignment. Um, and I keep it fairly narrow and, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, any kind of uh, information about the assignment or any kind of directions about how they're gonna achieve that. And so that naturally creates a space for a bunch of questions to, to come up. And they usually start off fairly um, um, odd and abstract, um, but it, there might be something like, um, you know, can I, I, can I paint it all in one color? And, and the answer will be yes, or can I paint it blue? And the answer is yes, or uh, can I paint it on something other than canvas? And the answer is yes. And could I paint it in oil or acrylic or watercolor? And, and the answer is yes. And uh, eventually, um, there might be some really abstract thing, like could I use makeup or food or some other obscure product in order to paint with it? And the answer is always yes. And they, the students come to the realization that I'm just answering yes to all of these questions. So in a way, the students are trying to establish a, uh, a boundary. Uh, they're, they're asking process questions in order to sort of figure out what the frame is um, for the assignment. But they're not good questions. And, and the reason I can answer yes to all the questions is, is because they're not good questions. Um, they're really just asking about, you know, like, what, what can I do? And, um, you know, uh, after they realize that whatever they're going to ask is, in terms of process, I'm going to say yes, they start to sort of push the, the boundaries a little bit. So they might say, um, do I have to use a, or, or can I, use something other than a brush in order to paint this assignment? And the answer will be yes, because it's really back to the same thing. Um, and then a, a student might say, um, uh, you know, is, it, is a brush a thing with bristles at the end of it, or could I use my shoe? And uh, that's a pretty interesting question. Is a, is a shoe a brush? You know, that, that starts to open up some new kinds of thinking. And when a question like that comes up in the classroom, there is a change that happens in the classroom. People start to like pay attention because they're listening for something that they haven't heard before. Um, and so uh, the, I'll say, yes, yes, a, you can paint um, with a shoe. Um, and then maybe if we're lucky, a student will say, um, what, do, what does painting with a shoe have to do with self-portrait? And that's a really good question. And that's a question that involves both process and product. It's a relational question. It's a question about what is the connection between the thing that I'm doing and the outcomes of the things that I'm doing? What is the dynamics between those two things? And in that case, you know, um, I might tell them a story um, because the same way that I'm doing right now is that I like to do in, in the classroom is to tell stories that are things that I've experienced in my own life. So in the case of like, how is a, a painting with a shoe related to self-portraiture? I once went to a, an art show at, um, in Toronto at the um, power plant gallery. And the when you walked in, the first thing that you saw was this huge pile of shoes on the ground. I knew it was an installation. I knew there was work on the wall, but it, there was also just work, you know, uh, in and amongst the studio. And so there was this, just this big pile of shoes um, sitting in the middle of the room. And I didn't need to read any of the um, descriptions. As soon as I saw that pile of shoes, I could relate to it based on experiences that I had. So. I had been to a concentration camp and I had seen piles of clothing and I knew from just the 
information, the brief information that I saw that the the work was about um, the artist's experiences um, and the artist's history. And that is a way in which a, a, a simple product, like a, a simple thing, like a shoe suddenly becomes manifested with so much otherness to it. Um, and it's often when telling a story like that, that there, again, there is this, this moment in the classroom when there's a quietness. And, and partly it is because of the experience and the seriousness of the experience, but partly it is also because the question has created this link to a, a, a description where the students have entered into an uncomfortable space where the thing that they once knew is, is different. And they're not going to be able to be with that thing in the same way again after hearing the story that the pattern for them has shifted in some way. So just as my experience of traveling and, and being at a concentration camp changed the way I experienced the gallery, that the, the students now hearing my story are now going to think differently about the way in which they think about painting and about brushes and all kinds of other things. Um, so when you get to that point of the process, a student might say, um, do I have to do a self-portrait? And I would say, yes, yeah, you have to do a self-portrait. And um, a student might say, um, could I paint a chair um, as a self-portrait? And I would say, yes, that's an interesting thought. So yes. And again, the student might ask the question, what is the, what does a chair have to do with a self-portrait? Like, how does, what is the relationship between a chair and this assignment being a self-portrait? That's a good question. Again, again, because the question is asking, what is the relationship between those things? And uh, in the case of the chair, I've told the story in my, in my class. At university, I uh, had to do a, a criticism of one of my classmates who always um, uh, painted chairs. And uh, when asked why she painted chairs, she would say, I just like chairs, <laughs> chairs are nice. Um, so uh, it was my job to write a criticism of her. And it was very hard to, you know, to write a criticism based upon an answer uh, given like that. So, so we just started talking and I said, you know, <laughs> why chairs? And she said, I just like chairs. And I asked her about three times. And she said, I like chairs because they're always there. You can leave the room and come back and they're still there. And um, this is a person who had experienced lots of uh, loss uh, in her youth. She'd moved around to a whole a group of different families and hadn't um, had much stability at all in her, in her youth. And suddenly the chair was the absence and the presence of someone. The chair was longing for someone and the chair was stability and the chair was so much more. Um, and the question created um, an answer for her that opened up all kinds of other questions about the nature of things in her life, the nature of objects and all those other things. And I guess um, that's always the sort of the, the great moment is that rather than thinking of it, one as um, transactional, you know, and answering, I know, I know the answer <laughs> um, or there is an answer. And so you can ask me and then I then will give it to you. Um, it's better to think of it always as how does the question create a collaboration? And the, the best kinds of questions, um, I think, create learning. And that learning is the recognition of some sort of pattern that wasn't uh, recognized before. The difference that makes a difference. It, 
there's some difference that is recognized. And then rather than driving forward into answer, the question, if it's that kind of question, and if it's that kind of learning, the question actually just creates a bridge to the development of new patterns. And so the question invariably leads to a better or more interesting or different kind of question. So the question creates a new pattern, the pattern creates a bridge, the bridge leads to a new question. Um, and um, I think the best kinds of questions, neither of the people know the answer to the question being asked. Um, and, and yet somehow the collaboration of the group, you know, how big, small, whatever it is, creates a dynamic that births a new, a new kind of series of questions. So I know in the, uh, Bill, I think is gonna talk a little bit about this. I think as we go forward, um, what, I, what I want us all to be listening for all the time is the questions that come up that, that are evocative, that, are, that evoke something within us that makes us wonder in some way about something that isn't necessarily linearly connected to any of the things that we've been talking about, but that might then spark the, uh, the next step, uh, the abstraction that leads to the recognition of that connection that takes us to the place that we didn't know that we were going to be going to. Um, and in art class, <laughs> when those, moments happen when that happens um there's this sort of celebratory recognition of moment of of this shift and, and it is always then also received as is is kind of awe i think one of the great processes um that i love so much about art classes is is critique we always think about critique as as criticism that we give each other feedback so we can critique the things that we can we can better it, and that's part of it but more importantly, criticism is the chance to um, share. Uh, these are the this is this is the result of the question that I asked, um, and this is the thing that I produced that that is going to lead to to more kinds of questions, and um, and in that process, sitting around, there's always a sense of um, sacred awe, beauty, um, a community, um, a connection, um, like all of the things that we so strive for is, is you know, healthy uh, communities um, sort of emerge in that process of, of when, a, when a work has honestly been a response to that kind of question, it itself generates those kinds of emotions, those kinds of feelings, which, you know, brings us back into this, um, to this cycle. Um, so yeah, so that's my, um, my, my take from last week is um, uh, we want to keep listening for and looking for the good questions that open us up into, into those possibilities. All right. Thank you, Andy. Of course, I have to cough the minute I unmute. <clears throat> my, uh, my nervous cough. All right. So I just want to welcome the, I see some new new people have popped up today. I see I see Numan and uh, Laura and uh, Perrin, and I'm meeting Aaron here for the first time virtually. And I'm going uh, to welcome everybody for what is our third gathering. But uh, these gatherings are iterative and they build. And so you know, you it you'll find I think as we go along that um, 
it's not required that you be at every one or that these, you know, they build in nonlinear ways and they carry and they hold and they come over. And so we, I think what we do is each week, we just keep passing the hole to the next week and we keep passing the hole to the next gathering. And, you know, we receive that. And so here we are today in our, our third round, our third iteration of this thing called the line and design which we're trying to figure out what it is and uh, what we're creating here. And every week that we meet, or it's every other week, but every, every time that we come together in this way, uh, we present a question to hold, as Andy talked about. And I've been calling these questions metaphorically koans from the Zen tradition, meaning a paradoxical question that is not answerable in trivial, simple ways, and is a designed such that it inspires great doubt within us to create that opening in that space. And so in our first week, our first koan, and this is the primary one, it's the one that we always come back to. And it could be in different forms though, although it's a primary koan. One form could be the question, what is health? Another one could be find health. Another one could be show me health. And they can shift and morph in all of these different ways. Week two, we entered into the koan, act to know. And that was held as a distinction versus our cultural addiction, which is know to act. We all are paralyzed to do things until we know what we think we should do, what the answer is. And of course, know to act sits us in this place towards endpoints and goals, which have their place. But act to know puts us in these cycles of process. And I think you heard that in Andy's talk today. And so our second one was act to know. And I just want to harvest a little bit of from last week of act to know what it came out from the stories. And there's a few different frames that that question, that koan, that, that holding act to know brought up. And we heard in the story um, of a school teacher in a kindergarten class, you know, in caught in a moment of surprise with a child who had soiled his, his shorts and was forced into a moment of action. You know, he had to act in that moment quickly. Quickly because um, the situation demanded it and quickly because the child was in need. So, and we saw one that was a very similar frame. And then when we, we heard a story about a horse, a race horse being brought out from a stall and going from concrete to dirt, and in that moment, kicking up a fuss, and how our storyteller in that moment had to act, you know, with this horse that was looking to buck and be wild. He had to, you know, in that moment, rather than freeze, had to come up with a decision to be decisive. How do I act? How do I respond to this horse? And so I guess we could call that frame a kind of reaction to the situation which I want to distinguish from our reactive habits, you know, the habits that we have over and over. That's a very different kind of reaction. These were novel reactions, unexpected, not prepared for, not something that was rehearsed or practiced. So sometimes life conspires to bring out an action, to, to, to bring us into an action, which of course brings us into a type of self-knowledge um, and a type of self-efficacy where both the storytellers at the end felt a sense of, you know, that they, that they had stepped into a place of accomplishment and had met the need and had served. So that was one type of frame that we learned from that question last week. What is act to know? We had another one that came out that was, that was interesting, which was the chance to go back to frames or parts of life that we think we know, in case this, the storyteller talked about an opportunity to go back to school for, for um, graduate level or you know postgraduate level learning of course there's all those thoughts of what that is we all have that idea these set ideas of what that will look like right um they're old stories they're old scripts we've all been to school we know what school's like we expect school to be a certain way we've been to school why would it be different so the holding that question act to know brought up the idea that can we go back to old things in different ways can we go back to what we've known, but act such that it's all different and all new again? And that came out of the holding of the question, act to know. I think the 
the perennial prescription for health. Plant a garden. Plant a garden. That was part of our storytelling of Act to Know. Something about gardening, and we shared our gardening stories. Just the sheer number of relations that are created the moment you turn that soil and plant those seeds. And so you saw in that frame, the cascading effects, the vastly divergent growing of relationships that come out of a single act, act to know, and all of the health that came out of that and the stories that were shared in that notion. And there was one little lovely metaphor that I wanted to go, which was that there was projects, projects of ecological health going on in the cities. So in the urban landscape, the, the urban society and culture deciding to unveil and unmask and open up again all the culverts that hold and hide all the rivers underneath our concrete cities. So the idea that we could open those rivers back up in their flow into the light of day again and have that flow participating in our life. And I thought that was a lovely metaphor to cap off the whole idea of acting to know, you know, the idea that the, the, our actions can uncover and reveal these sources of flow. Right. And uh, so that was last week, act to know. And that brings us to our koan this week, our new one. And this week, so I just, just take a second to take this in. About are within the importance of your preposition. I'll say that once more. About are within the importance of your preposition. Now you can also read preposition as preposition. I don't know how good you guys are at grammar. I, I'm old enough to remember the Saturday morning grammar. Eric remember, will remember this, you know, conjunction, junction, what's your function? You know, on these Saturday mornings, they'd throw in little grammar classes. So prepositions, these positional words that help to place us in space and time. And I'm calling them prepositions because they're so important. The notion of about versus within. Are you an about person? Or are you a within person? So this is the koan for today. What is your preposition? What is your preposition? So in this week, I, you know, as, as the uh, media feeds come by, um, I was reminded of a, of a, a great thinker and um, a great physician whose work I really admire. And his name is Ian McGilchrist. And he wrote the book called The Master and the Emissary. And this is just a, this, this book was an, it's an incredible book. And it's even, it, although it was written a number of years ago, it's, it's gener it continues to generate more and more interest uh, because it looks at, in a very interesting way, the fact that human beings carry two brains. We have a left hemisphere and we have a right hemisphere. And they're very distinct in their morphology, uh, in their form, in the jobs that they do. And they have this incredible bridge called the corpus callosum between them with all of this interconnectivity. But the essence of the book is that when, when, you, when you looked at um, various research, particularly work with stroke patients, it shows that these two brains see the world, see the world in two vastly different ways. And together, it creates a kind of binocular vision of a unified world. And unlike the old things that they'd say, oh, the right brain is artistic and, you know, the left brain is rational. That's not true. Both sides of the brains engage in everything in life, but they see it very distinctly, very differently. So the left brain controls the right hand and most of us, as you know, are right hand dominant, right? So this is the hemisphere of manipulation, right? This is the tasking where we can pick and parse and part together. And so this side of the brain sees the world as parts. It sees it as mechanical. It engages it acontextually in a non-living way. It is the thing that dissects and holds it in that way. The right half of the brain, however, is, is, is very different in how it perceives. It perceives the world as holes and flows. 
And while the left looks at a world of things and objects, the right sees a world of interrelationships and of subjectivity and of that connection. And the great thing about Ian McGilchrist's thesis is that he doesn't just leave it there as the sort of biology of the brain. He says, I think, you know, what's going on here explains what is happening throughout the world in these times culturally and historically. And by his take, in some ways, modern people are acting as though they have a right hemisphere brain injury, as though the right hemisphere of their brain has been knocked out. And here we have a world that is all of the left, of parts and pieces and manipulation, a relational, straight lines, linearity. You just have to look at the construction of our cities, right? Um, look at the movement into of modern art and the postmodern movement, where we saw boxes and cubes and lines and dissections and all of these forms. We see it all coming, even the artist that's trying to get away from it, still pulled in to their times. So we have these two very profound ways of seeing the world, the left and the right. And every one of us, I want us to think about it, are coming into this time in this moment. I want us all to recognize that we're all products of this generation, this time that we live in. And really, we've inherited, like I said, like almost a right-sided brain injury. That's how we're living our life. And there's this imbalance where the left dominates. And it's, it, it, of course, we've been taught to see the world in this way. And so there was a movement in this course, not just our generation, it's been building over you know, uh, hundreds of years. And so when philosophically, we see this move towards materialism, positivism, reductionism, and out of those early physical, sorry, those philosophical movements of, of the Enlightenment era, we saw the development of science as a methodology and modality to understand the world. And science, of course, is a left brain endeavor. It parts and it, 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 and it parses and it looks to reduce things down to their essential elements and tries to understand it from that perspective. And one of the things that came out of science with that idea, and this is sort of the core and it's essential to where we're today, is it developed a kind of illusion that only the left brain can do that says, I am separate from that which I observe. It had this belief, this idea that it could be outside of its systems of observation, that it could be impartial, that it could simply observe and that it's observing head no effect. And in medicine, we, we, we see this as well as doctors, we are trained. Um, I was trained to be impartial, right? That I could somehow be this impartial observer, feelingless, emotionless, you know, in some sense, um, an android, you know, to the human experience, where I could from that position, observe, diagnose, treat, assess. And we took great pride in this, in this positioning. Of course, it grew out of the science, it grew out of the philosophy. It was the application of these iterations down the line of this very left brain perspective. The interesting thing is if you ask patients, although we admire it among the profession ourselves, the patients don't like it. <laughs> you know, the patients, what do they want? They want warmth. They want connection. Uh, they don't want to have the sense of being probed, manipulated tested. Because that's what we do to machines. It's not what we do to living beings. Um, but somewhere this disconnect happened. And of course, the patients submit to it, because this is what they've been taught to do, just as we've been taught to treat in these ways. So this is the world of the scientists. This is the world of the physician, right? This idea that we our observations are neutral, and they don't have an effect. And this is what I'm calling the about world, right? So what would the right side of the brain say about this? Well, the right side of the brain sees just connection, only connection, only wholeness. This is the within world, right? This is the nested Russian dolls of system within system within system, but all connected, you know, through this, whole, not a hierarchy, but a holarchy, a holoarchy, not my word. I've lost the uh, author's name for that, but um, um, so today, then the koan for us as designers of health within ourselves as individuals, at the level of the individual, um, 
to the idea of our societies and cultures, to the ecologies in the natural world, whatever level we're looking to engage this notion of health design thinking and a pattern language and a way of engaging it, then the point of today is to say we have to learn to do it from within, where the very act of observing changes the system. Our very act of looking and, 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 and just engaging the system with our awareness changes the system that we are part of. And that's the reason. It's not some, you know, we can get into the levels of, 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 of quantum physics, of course, and, you know, you hear much talk about these kinds of things about the effect of the observer. That's not what I'm talking about. The very fact that we're part of these systems, the minute that we engage them, in our awareness and observation, which is an act, we change ourselves and thus change the system. We're always participants. You can never be out of your participation. This is the within world. I just want to share one little story that was really important in the last year in helping me understand who I was in this work. Because I've been, you know, asking these questions for a lot of years. You know, and for a long time now, um, it was an opening. It went from uh, living and studying and working with Indigenous elders and mentors that were my teachers and later became my family, and looking for metaphor to bridge back to understand the world I had come from and the world I live in, this world we all live in, this modern time. And I was looking for bridging metaphors. And my friend Eric here, he's, a, he's an osteopathic practitioner and an osteopathic teacher and just has carries the wonderful lineages of that holistic health tradition. And so back when I was uh, in my 20s, I actually, that's when I started investigating osteopathy as a possibility, because it was a Western metaphor that let me bridge into that wholeness. It was a within activity, right? It was a within practice. And another way to say that it was an aesthetic practice. Andy started talking about the art room. There's something about the, not the pragmatic nature, which is about, but the aesthetics of these relational engagements. And then from there, and that was a useful first metaphor, and more metaphors came. And the metaphors of cybernetics and the metaphors of complexity, these came later, and I, I soaked them up. I loved it because these were new ways to talk about these within experiences of relationship, of interaction, of connectivity, of wholeness. And I studied and I learned, and, and it wasn't through that learning was on my, it was through mentorship. It wasn't through the academy. My route through the academy, I, I dropped out of university twice. I hadn't gone back to school at this point yet. This was all the self-learning um, to make sense of things. And at some point I did go back, obviously, and, and, and found my way back to science and medicine. But I pursued this. And at some point it was interesting because uh, at some point, I guess, um, I had things to say about it and started to speak about it in the academic setting and with and found academic colleagues to have these discussions. And, you know, I'm quite quite pleased to have Catherine here and 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 uh, as a colleague and as she's working through as a PhD candidate and uh, doing wonderful work and wonderful consulting and stepping into this world of health broadly uh, at a global level and a societal level. And we had these ways that we start sharing and talking and and despite all of that, and it felt good because there was people to talk that understood the shared and common language um, that I, that I had now that they had, or that I could help them find, because that was part of it too, sharing this metaphor so that we could all find a way to talk with each other about these things. Up until a year ago, I still felt like a fraud because I was talking about these things. And I have to tell you, there's many, many more people that are much more intelligent that know about these things. I just go to the Santa Fe Institute and I listen to somebody like Stuart Kaufman or um, David Krakauer. I mean, these are brilliant individuals that can just elucidate and live and breathe, you know, the notions of complexity. And they're scientists, you know, par excellence. Like they do amazing science in the science of complexity, the science of wholeness. So here I am seeing myself as a fraud, you know, holding my way in the conversation, but not feeling it. And then this year, and I'm going to quote her in a minute here, I started having a conversation with Gregory Bateson's daughter, Nora Bateson. And she and her work, which I would call the work not of complexity science, but a work of embodied complexity, bringing it out in the relational sense, living it, sharing it, finding this way. She has a process she calls warm data. 
And one of the key tenets of her warm data process is this difference of about and within. And as soon as she said it, I was struck because I realized I get it now. I've never been an about person. It's always never fit. It's never felt right. I've never succeeded in being, uh, in mastering about. But the minute in that moment, I realized I was a within person. And within, I understood who I was. And, you know, as we gather here, this is about that withinness, right? Um, that's why I feel comfortable talking to you as a group. Oh, that was the phone I was supposed to shut off. There we go. Um, so, yeah. So there's the story for me about it within. I'm going to give you some quotes and we're going to open it up. But here are the quotes for today. I read these quotes to you. They're sometimes a little enigmatic and sometimes difficult to understand. That's how it's meant for. They're, they're rich. I'm not going to explain them. I'm not going to tell you what they're about. I'm going to read these quotes to invite you inside of the richness and texture of their words and how it holds you and either how it supports you or how it disrupts you, right? How it either bolsters you up or how they break you down. I don't care. Either is good. But let these words um, be heard as poetry, not prose, right? You hear these quotes, don't hear them as pr prosaically, hear them poetically, hear them centrally, hear them from within the very system, the writers themselves discovered it, all right? And hear it within the living of your own life, hear it as you need to hear it. This is within. Number one, by Humberto Maturana, one of the founders of the autopoiesis, the theory of life one of the early cybernetic, second order cybernetic thinkers, um, be core in our work as we go along. He stated, anything said is said by an observer. Anything said is said by an observer. So there's something in there, right? Because when we say, when we utter our utterances, we're in the world of language. So anytime we're in the world of language, right, it is a product of our observation, right? So to think about where does language hold you? How do you use it? Does language hold you in the about? Or can language be used in a way that brings us into the within? I don't know. It's a good question. Anything said is said by an observer. It's said from a perspective, right? So now we get the notion of multi-perspectival aspects of our being come in, multiple ways of knowing multiple positions of observership, right? The different realities that emerge. Next, I said this one last week, but I think it's probably a better place this week. I just liked it, so I put it in last week, but it's really better in this one. This is Heinz von Forster. Objectivity is a subject's delusion that observing can be done without him. Involving objectivity is abrogating responsibility, hence its popularity. Let me read that once more. Objectivity is a subject's delus delusion that observing can be done without him. Involving objectivity is abrogating responsibility, hence its popularity. Here's another one from Heinz. And I think that this is a little more tangential, but I think it applies here. The laws of nature are written by man. The laws of biology must write themselves. So the laws of nature are written by man. The laws of biology must write themselves. And this one was just serendipitous. Uh, it was on Nora's Facebook feed this week. And I already was planning on this as, as the, to the week's koan. Don't be so sure of the way things are. We are of, not about, within, always. Don't be so sure of the way things are. We are of, not about, within, always. And one more from the great family systems um, psychiatrist and psychotherapist who was known to embrace absurdity and play in his family systems therapy. He only ever worked with whole families. He didn't believe in individual therapy. 
he figured the family was the basic unit of psychotherapeutic intervention. And he, he wrote, I have a theory that theories are destructive. I have a theory that theories are destructive. And I want to give a little reading from Carl Whitaker's own work because he was a physician as, that worked with families as a psychotherapist that was always working from within. And it was as a result, he was a little bit heretical. And at times he was questioned for his approach because from that point of being that impassionate, disconnected observer, privileged outside of the system, he threw himself into the within of these systems, right? It was threatening to the order, right? So he was criticized for his work, but it was fantastic work, creating fantastic change. So this is from um, one of his books. I think it was called Dancing with the Family or something to that effect. But here's, um, I forgot my glasses, so I'm going to have to extend my arms here. So the only way to honestly encourage people to venture forth into such frightening terror ter territory is to use yourself. The therapist must be willing to expose some of his own symbolic experiences to reveal his personal belief system, to offer glimpses into his infrastructure. When you dare to expose the family to this in tiny fragments, they're left with slivers of you in them. When they come face to face with part of your insides, they have to decide what to do with it. They're free to produce their own extrapolations, depending on how it reverberates inside of them. If the therapist, for example, starts talking about himself as an imperfect being, or reveals his feelings for, of dependency, fear, or confusion, the family may be tempted to look inwards too. The approach is geared to offer them a mere image opportunity of exploring and maybe exposing more of their own belief system of their infrastructure. One of the exciting aspects of this sort of work is the discovery that the therapy involved evolves and we are more and more free to engage in a symbolic exchange. It becomes a growth experience for me too. Often it seems that I get more out of it. The more, uh, the, it often seems that the more I get out of it, the more they get out of it. The outcome of meeting our symbolic word, worlds can be truly exciting. In a sense, we all become patients to the process. I want you to hear that last sentence. In a sense, in this kind of within engagement with each other, in a sense, we all become patients to the process. In that spirit, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what this will ultimately be about. I don't know where we're going. The koans have been working on me for a lot, long time. There is great doubt. I don't know what I'll be able to offer in this. I don't know if we will pull this off, but here we are. So as Andy started talking about questions today, and, I, and, and Heinz von Forster made a great distinction. He, he, he agreed there was good questions and bad questions. You know that saying, there's no such thing as a bad question? That's bullshit. The problem that you got told that, though, is because you only get fed bad questions by the system that is about. So it doesn't want you to know that. It doesn't want to give up the game. So Heinz von Forster said there's two kinds of questions. There's trivial questions and there's non-trivial questions. And Andy went through that very well. Every time his student asked a question that was trivial, and you saw there was degrees, they were edging out of trivial. But until that moment that they're out of the trivial, the answer is yes. And the minute they're out of the trivial, the answer becomes something like, huh, that's a good question. I don't know. What do you think about that? Right? And now we're in the movement of it. So, the last two sessions, we really sort of emphasized storytelling, and there will always be room for storytelling. And I am going to say that we are going to engage the poetic rather than the prosaic going for, forth for our last hour here. What 
I want to put though today is for the newcomers, for those that have been here, you know, for us that, you know, Andy and I have been thinking this for a long time. Today, I'd like to put forth the notion of questions, the questions of belief, the questions of uh, the nature of criticism and critique, right? We've got three koans. What is health? Act to know. And our newest one today, about or within, the importance of your pre-position. What is this thing we're doing here? What is this health design thinking? What is a pattern language? What is all these things that we're spouting? Why come together? Why put our times? Let's question it. Is this a value? Maybe we should throw it all out here at session number three. Maybe it should end tonight. Or maybe it shouldn't. Maybe there's a value. So I'm going to step back now and I'm going to put some space here for questions, beliefs, statements, critique, criticism, emotion, great doubt. We don't have Greg with us tonight, so we'll look for the hands. Let's settle for a second. Let them work you. What is health? Look at the world as you ask it. Look at, your, look at what's going on. Act to know. Look at your own paralysis in the world we live in. Within or without. What position are you now? Are you an outsider right now? Do you feel separate? Zoom does that, right? But can we get past the technology and come within? Let me start you with a question. Let's go back to our primary. But I'll change it a little. Where is your health today in this moment? Where is it? Where is your health? What is your health? Who is your health? How is your health? Where is it today or even more so in this moment? There's a question. Bill, I'm going to uh, um, uh, talk a little bit about the, I saw Bill this week um, on uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday, and um, we got together for um, a sweat lodge. Uh, and, uh, you know, a sweat lodge is, a, is sort of the, <laughs> the perfect living metaphor for the about within um, uh, conversation. And of course, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite wonderful to, to sit in a, a lodge um, with some people who have gathered um, for healing um, with a doctor and to be, be reminded that there are doctors who, who, um, whose um, bag um, is big enough to hold um, things like um, um, sweat lodge ceremonies. I think, you know, when we've been um, doing it for almost 30 years and we've had, you know, literally uh, thousands of people come and uh, at, attend lodges with us. And we, we tend to get a lot of about questions. You know, what is this about? Um, you know, um, <laughs> what, what is the, what does this represent? What is this mean what is this metaphor what is this and essentially of course you know the a, a lodge is a is um a womb um and you're literally gathering in the womb and you're you know you're um you're moving through a seasonal cycle and you're moving through a life and death cycle and um uh the process is literally of a um a birth um or a rebirth ceremony um and it's um it's very beautiful and it's very emotional and of course there's there's lots of little 
um, parts of it um, that we try to honor the traditions that we were uh, taught. Um, the the about parts, the ceremonial parts, but of course, it's 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 none of those things really. It's 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 not as simple as gathering wood or going into the woods and and connecting with nature. It's not as simple as just starting a fire. It's not as simple as just gathering people. It's 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 not it's not the medicine and it's not the the food that's shared afterwards and it's it's not all those things it's it's not any of those things it's 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 something else it's something um it holds um wholeness the ceremony literally holds wholeness um and the lodge itself um you know that womb is, is kind of like um the question that births questions you know it it, it it, it, it's it's a renewal process and when we were in on on tuesday um i was on a hard week and i was pretty emotional and you know bill said how you doing and i said you know it's pretty tough and but you know feeling good feeling good and and then i said but it's you know it's uh, it's always easy in the lodge you know and no matter how much you're suffering in the lodge, no matter how much struggle you're going through in the lodge, no, no, you know, no matter what it is that you've brought in there to deal with, that's the life process. And being alive isn't hard. It's beautiful. It's, <laughs> it's struggle, but it's struggle towards itself it's aesthetic and the hard part isn't the lodge the hard part is leaving the lodge and going back out into the about world and you know trying to get back into these boxes and frames and lines that you know that should make sense um but don't because they are because they're not connected in the way that, um, you know, things like ceremonies that have been practiced for thousands of years are. Um, so that was a that was a really, it was a really lovely reminder um, on Tuesday again. You know, I think, um, I think um, there's a, there's a, a a Bushman quote that says, um, you know. Um, why do we get sick? Um, we get sick because if we didn't, we would forget to dance. You know, we would forget to gather. <laughs> we we have ceremony. We get we go to the lodge because um, because we're sick. But why do we get sick? We get sick because otherwise we'd forget that we have to gather. That we have to go to the lodge. That we have to <laughs> we have to go in words once more. Right. That's. What you have to do, you have to be in the within, right? You have to be the biology that's inventing itself, it's writing itself. Um, and um, yeah, the other thing that I just since I'm on it, the thing that sort of came up in the ceremony for me was this the, we go through these cycles, and um, and the the third door is is always a kind of a tough door. It's this third round, and it, it's 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 kind of like the fall, just before winter, you know, the coming of winter. And so one of the sort of the themes that came up uh, was um, that winter is this you know right at the end, just before spring. There's this time where um, you can tap trees and get maple syrup. And we sort of talked about the sweetness of maple syrup and about, you know, how the, the very, the nature of like good questions is that they get shared. The nature of good art is that they get shared. The nature of good ceremonies that become sharing. The nature of collecting syrup is, is that you, that you want to share it, that it, that it, that it engenders, um, you know, like that doctor sharing his own stories so that the stories can become part of a collaborative interaction. Um, 
you know, the, the, this idea that um, you, you have to tap the tree. <laughs> you have to, you have to have a relationship with the trees. You have to know the trees. Then you have to tap the trees. Then you have to collect it. And then you have to boil it down and you have to wait. And there's all this process. But at the end of it, you know, there's this sweetness that, that comes out of it. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, uh, I think this is what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> uh and at the end of the ceremony it was just that that it was one it's just inside inward is is good is healing and the other thing is is that being in relationship with life and nature uh, tapping into it and and recognizing its sweetness and the work that goes into getting that sweetness is really you know is really important uh, I, this is, um, was given to me at the end of lodge and, uh, <laughs> and now I pass this, uh, metaphorical sweetness on to you. <laughs> you know, as we're, we're talking, I'm, I'm hearing Andy share some sweetness and I'm wanting to sort of recalibrate and aim better with my question for you guys. Last time we talked about the etymology of the word sin in the Hebrew or the Greek context, meaning off target. It was an archery term. And so let me make my questions sweeter and more gentle and more kind. They all seem like different questions, but ultimately they're the same question if you're within. Every question is the same question if you're within, because the wholeness takes you back into the wholeness. Let me ask you this question. What? What? brought you here what brought you here to tonight or for those that have been throughout what's brought you here i see michael is that a hand michael you, know, you got to unmute there uh, okay am i on now yeah 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 okay good um i like the connection i like the connection tremendously um what I find, I don't know where I'm going to go with this, but a couple thoughts. I keep thinking of the spider web, and it it, it came out of the uh, the first session that we had in our interconnectedness. Uh, I was actually part of a a group that did transpersonal therapy. I have a Christian background, but my colleagues were Buddhists, people of native spirituality, people from the Wiccan background. It really opened me up because I came from Little Old Guelph and I went to Toronto a number of years ago and met people from different walks of life. And it was enriching, to say the least. We're interconnected. We're all different age groups here and probably one of the older ones here. But when someone tells a story, whether Dr. Sullivan's talking about something or Andrew's talking about something, it's almost like I, I'm trying to I can relate it to something in, in my life or I think, Oh, I haven't had a, that thought of that angle before. Sometimes it's a smooth transition. Sometimes it's a very sticky one, like, like this thing. If I could give it a specific example, when I was in that transpersonal program, I don't remember the exact name. It was something like we did a misplaced parts party. We got to know each other so well over three or four years that people would, would say, I want you to play this part. I want you to play this role. For example, my colleagues told me to play the role of a woman. And I don't know why I was terribly uncomfortable with that. I had to dress up like a woman and I had to act a, a certain part. And I love women. but So I don't know why I was uncomfortable with it. But maybe being in feminine attire, I'm not sure. But I did it. And um, it gave me a new take on the world, uh, a different role, a different perspective, uh, maybe seeing the world from a different way. So we were all given roles by our colleagues to play a role which could have resembled our shadow or could have just resembled an unseen part of ourselves, or just to see how you would handle a different perspective. I don't know if that makes a lot of sense to you or not, but I, I don't remember the exact term, but I just remember it was a very interesting dialogue and um, a very different form of learning for me, something I hadn't experienced in any other course before. And by the way, 
I'm still interconnected with a number of people from that course more than a decade later. We still uh, will talk to each other and do our, our check-in to see how, how one another is doing. So I'm here tonight to, uh, this is good for my health when I can interact with other <laughs> people and feel uh, enlightened, uh, sometimes laugh, and, and, and hear, oh, that's a, that's a really neat nugget. That's like a gold nugget. I, I've never heard that before. Let me think about it a little. Let me chew on it a little bit. You know, that kind of idea. Thank you. Michael, there's an interesting synchronicity. And when I was reading Carl Whitaker's from his book, uh, I sort of, I struggled whether I was, I, 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 I left out a, a couple of sentences. I jumped uh, from the one part to the next paragraph. And I thought, oh, is this, you know, superfluous? But I think, I think if I'm being honest, it was more, uh, again, uh, being uncomfortable and, and uh, uncomfortable in the territory of, you know, the, the, the conversation about our differences and um, the distinctions and our identities. Um, but in his description of the work he did, there was a line here that I omitted, which was making so in his work with families, right, in these absurdities and these different things, he writes, making personal the femininity in men, the masculinity in women, or the infantilization we feel, um, we all feel that can lead to growth. All of these territories can be opened up. There are areas people don't ordinarily talk about, or even think about, probably because they are too important. And I struggled to read that actually, because I thought, oh, you know, controversy, territory, you know, identities, you know, these kind of things. But I, I appreciate, but, you know, there's a difference when we talk about identity, we get into trouble. But we, when we talk from within our experiences, you know, including that experience you had within your group, within your gathering at the request of the people as part of that healing process. Right. And so I, I, it makes me wonder, you know, how much of, of, of the fact that our dialogue and conversation discourse is breaking down in the world because we're all in positions of about, about. But now when we start to work the way we, to within, right, we, we're now within and what are we within? We're, we're within our vulnerabilities, right? We're within our vulnerabilities for sure. Uh, it takes, there's risk, right? There's, so there's risk in, in the within world. Life is a risky proposition. So thank you for that sharing. And, 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 and again, I, I want to put the vulnerability to say, I didn't have the courage to go there even reading someone else's words, never mind my own experience, right? Okay, I saw Chris and then Perrin and then Olga. Chris. Sorry, my unmute button wasn't working. Um, you, you asked what, um, what it was that brought everyone here. Um, and I wanted to be just completely open and honest about the fact that I initially um, requested to uh, to be a part of this and, and initially joined in just sheerly out of curiosity. Um, I Honestly, I wanted to know what is it all about, to use the current terminology. Um, so the in the uh, <laughs> in the um, for the initial meeting, it was uh, like it was just sheer curiosity. I'd actually um, I wasn't even aware that um, uh, Dr. Sutherland's website had been updated at all. I haven't been on it in um, in quite a while. Um, so I, I went on and I discovered it and I followed through to the Instagram posts, to the Facebook posts, to the YouTube channel and watched a couple of the earlier videos prior to our own sessions and really just became more and more curious about what um, what was going on and, and what everything was about. So the, in the, for the first meeting, it was sheer curiosity um, into the, the second meeting where I became much more intrigued with the amount of sharing and the conversation that was happening and the learnings that were being shared and the experiences that were being shared. And that is what has drawn me back again this week is to continue to be a part of those shared experiences with um, a number of people who outside of this, I honestly, I don't know. Um, I mean, I know obviously Dr. Sutherland, I know Michael, um, but everybody else who is here, I've, I've never met 
in person. I, I don't know that I ever will meet in person. Um, so to be able to have this kind of shared experience through the um, the use of this technology has been just um, very interesting to me. And and to hear differing opinions and differing life stories as just it's really what is keeping me coming back. And I I hope to continue to come back through the remainder of the meetings, provided my internet doesn't decide to shut off or something, and just be a part of it, whether um, actively involved like right now or just sitting back and listening to what everyone else has to say. So Chris, there's, I, I love the notion of curiosity and I, I wanna bring up a little distinction of how that works when, as far as about and within. So there's, there's different ways to be curious. You can use curiosity as a trap to stay in about forever, right? As you just continue to want to learn about, and if I use that word learn, even not as the deep learning, a trivial kind of learning about things, right? Amassing knowledge about, about curiosity, like Andy had mentioned there, you know, people coming to say the sweat lodge and asking, what's this about? What's that about? You know, rather than the, than the immersion of it. But curiosity, so curiosity can keep you in about and out of within. However, another, if you, you're skillful with your curiosity, it becomes the bridge from about to within. Just like Andy started at the talk with the good questions. He talked about how these questions become bridges into process and into art and into the aesthetic and into the whole and into the learning. And if you're skillful, your curiosity becomes deeper, it becomes an inquiry. And that inquiry then shows itself as learning. And that learning transforms eventually into wonderment and awe, right? And you know, at that point that you're within. And so I love it. I love it when our curiosities bring us and we may come in initially about, remember, we both have a left and a right brain. This is not about being anti about none of these koans. You know, like when I go back to act to know versus know to act, it doesn't mean knowing to act at times when it's appropriate is appropriate. Of course it is. It's about creating primaries and secondaries. It's about creating the right positions that nourish and feed rather than create pathologies, you know, referencing back to that first session we had. So curiosity, I love it. Oh, hey, so I, I see the new say, one as um, well. Yeah. Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I just want to say, um, yeah, and when Bill speaks about um, doubt in this process, and he talks about his own doubt and, and you know, that unknowing, um, that's that's very authentic. Like, um, Bill, and I, Bill and I have been doing this for a long time, and, and when we talk about, you know, what are we doing? What's going to happen? Like, whatever it is that we are doing together, um, whether it's, you know, the, the, the painting or anything else, um, the process is always um, uh, powered by curiosity and um, doubt, and I and I and I almost want to say, you know, I, I want to use the word faith um, um, carefully here, but there because we have been doing this so long, what drives us is is the wonderment and awe of the emerging things that occur as a result of us putting our doubt aside and participating of of entering into something and because we've done it and because we've seen over and over again the outcome of those interactions we we even though we have doubt about like what is this we still step into it because we see what comes out of it and um, what comes out of it is often um, or most often surprising and not of our direction or not of our control or not of our, our planning but just of, of 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 interaction so yeah I'm, I'm glad your curiosity brought you here Chris <laughs> right thank you thank you We've got Perrin, we've got Perrin, Olga, Newman, and Aaron. So let's start with Perrin. Hi, um, thanks for doing this. This is a really great conversation. Um, so I've taken um, I've taken some notes as um, Andrew and Bill were speaking. So I'll kind of go through some reflections that I have on those notes, 
and then and um, by answering your question more directly about what brought me here. Um, so just, you know, kind of starting in kind of chronicle, in chronological order um, of how these ideas were raised. Um, so I was, you know, sort of trained initially in sort of a fine and performing arts community as well as a design community. And so um, reflecting on some of the things that Andrew said in the beginning, I think, you know, one of the great things about critique within those communities and the way that we approach critique is that um, everything is context based. And so that goes, I mean, that goes back to, you know, some things that, you know, Bill was saying about relationality. And so when we look at a piece of work, we always, you know, kind of ask the question of, you know, what is the artist or the designer's intention, right? We don't, we don't claim to have sort of an objective, an objectively sort of right or wrong approach in, in any number of projects. We, we sort of, you know, sort of probe at like, what are, what are the intentions and what are the kind of goals or the, you know, the questions or problems that are being addressed? which is very different from academia. I think in academia, we, a lot of times in, you know, sort of criticism or in critique or in processes of critique, we want to try to find, you know, like kind of right and wrong. And we, and we try to kind of pick out, um, we sort of pride ourselves on being able to kind of like pick out things that we consider to be, you know, sort of wrong in some way and, and to, to sort of fix them. Um, and then, you know, kind of moving on to this idea of, that, you know, Andrew was raising about, you know, the idea and the concept of a chair, I think. Um, so one of my favorite assignments as a, as an undergraduate student was where um, a teacher did ask us to design and build a chair, um, but that would, you know, have some sort of element of surprise to it. And so, I, I mean, I appreciate, you know, this, um, the idea of like sort of reconceptualizing what things are, right? And, and sort of, um, and redefining what that thing means within the context of, you know, how we're using it or how, or, you know, sort of its symbolic meaning as well. The, um, what this te the example that this teacher gave us in to introduce this assignment was basically a chair deconstructed. So it was um, a chair that was, you know, cut into a number of pieces and hung in, hung on a wall, still looking, like a chair, but sort of, you know, sort of broken down into these different parts, which then, I mean, it, and that was actually the, that was the one assignment that kind of triggered me to take interest in pattern language and in, you know, this idea of looking at like the elements of a system and, you know, like how do things, how do like things within that system kind of break down and then reorganize. And I think, um, and so I think then what, you know, what Bill was saying about like science you know, being this thing that kind of breaks things down into essential parts and elements. I think there's kind of a tension there between that and then sort of rethinking about like what we mean by pattern, because um, because it's really, it's sort of like to understand the pattern in a way you need to understand the parts, right? And the, the elements and how they kind of recombine into something new. Um, and so then, I mean, but then, you know, I think you're right about, you know, this idea of kind of interconnectivity. Ultimately, there's, and, and you know, referencing Stuart Kaufman as well, and, you know, the quote that you gave by Heinz, I think, so Stuart Kaufman has this, you know, sort of piece or this, you know, sort of um, passage in his book, Humanity in a Creative Universe, where he says that the universal laws of nature are also evolving, right, that, that, that they're not actually fixed. And that's something that kind of, you know, that really kind of blows my mind because I can't, I myself cannot understand how a universal law of nature can itself, you know, kind of change. But I think that, um, but I think, you know, when we talk about complexity, I think there's, there's a really interesting sort of tension to explore there about whether, you know, the parts and the essential elements that we're working with, or these, you know, sort of essential laws that then sort of generate the pattern if how those are changing. And I think that's, I think that's an important question, like whether the roots of the system are somehow are, are somehow changing in ways that kind of create a new um, end product or sort of an end result. Um, and I think then sort of, I mean, kind of tying that to what Bill was saying before about, um, you know, sort of psychotherapy and being kind of open about your own sort of symbolic um, references and your own sort of experiences. There's sort of a question that comes up for me about um, like in the in the there's sort of a difference in sort of design versus visual art that people make or a distinction that people make where which I think is actually an artificial distinction where people will say that you know like the arts are kind of expressive whereas design is supposed to be functional um, and I think um, and so but what that means is that like 
you know, like as a, and, and actually, well, I'll say, I don't actually necessarily agree with that. I think that a lot of times, like a lot of like great artwork, it's sort of, it reflects on the spirit of the times um, more so than it's sort of an expression of, you know, the artist's reflection on the spirit of the times more so than their own kind of internal um, rather than their own kind of internal ex life experience. Um, but then this is something where like designers will be like really kind of um, specific about kind of about being in a way objective, right. Rather than subjective and sort of um, saying that like, you know, like you, you don't, you don't want to be like putting your own kind of personal expression into your design work because you're developing it for, you know, kind of the greater good or the public good. Um, and so I think, I guess that, you know, that just that question kind of came up to me about with, you know, with respect to kind of psychotherapy and, you know, like, you know, like whether, and I guess like I would sort of relate it to, to sort of some, um, you know, sort of the comparison between kind of Taoism and shamanism where, um, you know, sort of Taoists in a way sort of try to sort of separate themselves from attachment or try to kind of detach from sort of situations and, or, you know, kind of have sort of try to separate themselves from having kind of emotional attachment. Whereas in shamanism, there is, I've sort of, you know, what, from what I've read, there's kind of very much this notion of like, you know, like walking through the fire and being a part of that, you know, that kind of messy life experience and seeing the beauty and the struggle as, you know, Andrew was sort of saying. And so that's something, I mean, that's something that I'm wrestling with. I, I don't know what side of the fence I sit on um, in that respect. I think, I mean, I, I also appreciate this, you know, this comment on, you know, kind of the identity politics, which was, you know, sort of mentioned briefly. And I think um, I'll, I'll just note, you know, like for myself, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of conflict right now. It's, it's a, those are very like controversial topics right now. And for myself, I feel like as an academic, I haven't, you know, done enough processing of those debates to even be able to have an objective opinion or to, you know, to be able to like comment on it without saying something that might be, you know, hurtful and offensive, you know, to, you know, to people in, you know, sort of vulnerable positions. And I think, um, I think that's, an, that's kind of another question that, you know, is sort of relevant from the perspective of, you know, sort of group psychotherapy and, you know, or even like kind of group discussions where, um, you know, people say like, you can't really comment on someone else's experience as, as if it's, you know, kind of a, an academic exercise. Um, and so coming back to, you know, your question about, um, you know, what it is that brought me here, I think, um, so I, I guess, you know, myself, I've been trained, you know, sort of more traditionally within, like I said, these kinds of arts and design contexts, working on kind of urban design and applying kind of a pattern language um, theory. Um, but then I've also, um, I mean, I've also, I also have some experience in a little bit of, you know, sort of healthcare research, Indigenous healthcare, looking at sort of, you know, the, the de-technologization of healthcare and, um, and sort of, um, and bioethics. And in terms of, you know, my own approach to urban design, um, you know, years ago, I sort of tried to kind of break from convention and, you know, to sort of look at the city, for example, from, you know, more of a human-centered and eco-centered perspective which also evokes kind of a complexity perspective. And, um, and so that kind of led me to kind of, you know, break open all of the, you know, all of the lenses that I was applying in my own work um, in ways, similar ways to what, you know, you're doing in these conversations. Thank you, Perrin. I, I, the, um, I just wanted just so everybody can, I just, if we can just look at the, 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 the aesthetic of your commentary rather than the content so I'm not going to talk about what you said, what you said, you talked about it wonderfully. And, and thank you. Uh, it was very, very, it was a lovely articulation. I want everybody to note as Perrin was talking. Um, and, and this is my perspective, but I, I thought there was a lovely holding of tensions, right? Did, she, did you hear the tensions that she's hold that she was holding you know, of these, of, of the left and the right, right. Of, 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 of the part and of the whole of the about and the within, and that it's not easy that we struggle in that, you know, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not, but, but, but that, that, that tension was in her conversation. 
And that was wonderful. And what I'm going to encourage everybody as you pull these, these tensions up that these questions and approaches bring within you, it's not to resolve the tension. That's an important point here. We, you know, we think that we are asking these questions so that we can resolve something in us. And it's not that. We're asking these questions so that we can have these tensions unresolved in us. Because it's that tension done skillfully that births the creativity, right? That births the mixing, that births um, the dialectics, that births these things into, you know, broader and new things in the world. So thank you, parent. I thought it was, thank you for, um, you know, just, just from my, you know, just from my own position, I, 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 I appreciated that, um, that where you were speaking from within in this moment. Uh, is Olga with us still? Did she have to, I know she had to go off to class. Did I know her, did, are you still there, Olga? Yeah, I'm did, still did here. You, you got your um, questions I down? have three yeah. minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Three minutes. Um, give give it to us. <laughs> um, I recently moved from the suburbs and out into the country, and I've, I'm now in a setting that is much less complicated, but much more complex and much more rich. And I find myself in the midst of all these stories, these that are much larger than myself, and I'm woven into these relationships and interactions. And I made small in that, but I also feel myself more whole here. And that's not dissimilar from what I'm searching for uh, with you and this project. And when you find fox prints outside your door in the morning, you follow them and you see where they lead you. So I guess that's what I'm doing. Uh, I love that. <laughs> When you find fox prints in front of your door in the morning, you follow them and you see where they lead you. You'll yeah, hear us come but, back to them um, and what is the tracking fox? all the time. Go ahead, Andy, sorry. <laughs> what does the fox represent in Russia? A trickster. <laughs> all the more reasons to follow it. <laughs> yes. Because yes. if you're an about person, you know, here's the thing, you'll hear the trickster in mythology all the time. Right, you, we we we're, we're unique in that we have a um, um, a cosmology that likes good and evil, but most of the world doesn't do a good evil split. Um, they do a <laughs> creation and trickster split, right? Um, and 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 the creation and trickster split is the the world gets created and the creator sort of backs off, and the trickster is in there with all the kinetics energetically, and you know the way to think of the trickster the, and Olga's fox in this case, right? is, um, um, you know, is to recognize that when we get stuck in a bout, when we get stuck in parts, when we get stuck on those lines, when we're having trouble getting out of it, right? Look for it. Those tricksters will show up and they will play with you, right? They will, they will, they will miss and turn and spin until all of a sudden you're no longer on the outside, but you're on the inside. But don't get too comfortable on the inside because they'll show up there too. And they'll spin you and turn you and they'll throw you back out again. And you'll be back in this tension back and forth. So let's be thankful for Olga's fox that's visiting her in the morning. I don't know if Numan can hear us. I don't know if he, oh, there he is. Numan, uh, I saw that uh, popped up. You have a comment. Which, and I'm going to go to Aaron. I saw Aaron's hand there still too. Hey, Bill. Good to see you, doctor. Uh, good to see you. I just wanted to speak about without and within because... You know, as I um, progress in my life's journey, it has, it has, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sorry, I just going to make sure everybody's muted here. Yeah. So as I progress in my life's journey, it's increasingly been about, you see, I felt for the longest time that I'm being pulled in so many different directions. Um, I'm a fellow physician as well. And, you know, we have a very busy professional life and then all the other demands um on me you know family children um my own personal pursuits and everything else pulled in all sorts of different directions right and then at some point um i started to go within through meditation 
through spending time in nature, um, you know, through contemplation, through journaling. And what I've come to realize is that just like you talk about that tension, um, my life's journey has truly been about holding that balance between within and without, because, you know, we cannot just live our lives within. It'd be great to always be in meditation and always be contemplating, but we live in a we live in a, in a in a world that requires us to do things. It requires us to to earn a living, to uh, to interact with others. Uh, we live in communities. We live in societies. We live in nations, and and we live in a very complex world. But really, the journey is about um, striking that balance between both within and without, and um, and I, and on that plays in with the first question is what is health and health is holding that balance right living your life in balance so i just wanted to make that comment i am um, i want i want to bring up um with with your with what you just shared there uh, a, a distinction of 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 the two withins um so that there is um that there is the within, like you were saying, the internal within, right? Meditatively, introspectively, um, our internal life. Of course, we there's the, and it's an interesting perspective because in some ways meditation is a chance to be two things. You can you can actually be within, right? Like within um, uh, the sensations, the thoughts, the felt senses within the body. You can be within all of that. And meditation also creates an observer perspective where you can look about, where you can, uh, you can, you can almost sort of turn the camera back on yourself and see who, you know, who is this person, right? There's an interesting double there, right? Which is rather than the one or the other, can you find that unity, uh, you know, the meditation practice, I think in some ways, and often in therapy, we'll talk about this sort of double position where you feel fully, you know, you're in your full sensual nature, uh, in all of its horror, <laughs> as well as beauty. But you're, but if you stay with just that, you can get lost in it overwhelmed by it. Uh, for those that have been traumatized, you know, the, the, the trauma of that can be overwhelming. But there's the opposite position, like that observer where we can turn it back and we can look in a detached way. And we don't want to just get stuck there either, because then everything becomes bland. There's no feeling, there's no color. It's just that detachment and that abstraction of you seeing yourself in this abstract way. So there's this double vision that you can be uh, both within the feeling and observing yourself within the feeling, right? And so that's that about and within um, being unified as a, as a single practice, right? As that comes together. There's another within, and I, and, I, and I want to sort of push back on you a little bit on this one, which is the within of the interactional world, right? So, and that's back to the, are we observers with, you know, that are, that are just outside and are observing, or are we participants? And, and, I, and, and, I, and I think the critique is real. Like, I, I, I feel that it's, the world is always pulling us into the observer, like separation from each other, right? But in our busy lives, in our work, in our families, in all of these endeavors that require of us, and it's hard. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it requires our about mind. But like right now, you know, even across Zoom, you know, we, we have our friendship here and we're, we are talking across Zoom. Like right now in this moment, I feel we're within the interaction and the holding of this friendship, of this group, of this collection of coming together today, right? Um, we are in the within position. And I just wonder if we can't extrapolate that to all the different aspects of our life, that when we're with our family, we're within the family, you know, when we're with our, and this is hard, you know it, but, but I know the work you've done with this, you know, that when we're with our patients, we're with them. And we're within that doctor patient relationship, but it's a within, right? We're not outside and the patient is there, you know, sort of in a sense, like, like naked and afraid, you know, in, in, in front of the medical gaze, right? I, I think we, so there's these two withins, right? The within within us and yeah. the within this system of our experience. And I want people to, to hold that double, right? And know that you can have an about in that double as well too, where you're outside of it. Again, it has its useful. So rather than 
you know, maybe we can change the koan slightly instead of making it an or or a versus an about or within, can we create it as a double, a virtuous double, right? Where we can both be within and about with those double gaze, that double gaze, splitting that attention and be in that simultaneously. That would be a good thing. That's uh intra- I love your perspective, Bill. Uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for that. And I actually, I have to go. So thank you. Thank uh, you for joining us. I hope you can come back again. That's great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to be wary of time and I know Aaron has been waiting patiently and then we'll open it back up again to some more, some replies to the replies. Aaron. Yeah, I, I think there's a sense of um, beingness in the moment that, that I've been, that's been going through my mind and listening to people and uh, hearing the kind of things we're circ- or talking about, I think. So within me, there's a sense of um, what's my relation to aboutness or beingness. And it feels like in some sense, it's in front of the bubble and it's, it's, it's past the point of um, cohesion in language where, where it's, um, it, it, it requires uh, listening and paying attention to express what that beingness is in a way that um, isn't, is, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use the phrase isn't stale, because that sounds stale, but, but something. Um, and there's a feeling of like aliveness, I think, that I've, I've felt a lot, especially in different conversations with friends in the past several weeks, just kind of experimenting this conversation of what, what does that sense of aliveness feel like? And what is that what, is, what does that look like in relationship? And what does it mean for a relationship to be within in itself? Those are just some words. Did you want to jump in there, Andy? Oh, you can unmute yourself there, brother. Oh, I thought you'd muted me on purpose. Um, yeah, you know what, Aaron? Um, yeah, um, what you were just saying was was beautiful, and 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 um, it's funny. I was thinking um, in that last conversation just about um, within and about that Bill was sort of um, suggesting that there is this, that we have to be careful that when, when we're using words, that we, we don't create those separations that we're trying to, you know, m- move um, through right now. And I was thinking about, you know, like in the, the idea of that monologue of, of just talking you know the question that, that that isn't about anything and then dialogue the question that is asks for an interaction of some sort and then metalogue um the conversation which which demonstrates in its conversing what it is that it's about um and i i thought Aaron, your description uh, and the way, again, the aesthetics of the way in which you talked about it was a perfect example of what it was that you were um, you were speaking about, uh, the tentativeness of your use of language, the spacing um, that you gave, the hesitancy was, you know, like the words become then less important than actually us just being present and hearing what it is that you're saying on all of those lovely levels that you're, that you're saying at that. Um, so yeah, um, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> there's, you know, just, um, just, just, just going with what Andy's saying too. There's, there's, um, there's some, ri- there's, there's rich. I, I, I love this conversation from everybody has been rich and whether we're talking about things which we're all pretty skilled in, you know, we do that well, 
but I love the richness that we're, as we strive to talk from within, right? As we try to talk from within something that we can never, ever grasp because the part can never contain the whole that inversion can't happen right the whole holds the part right so there's always this mystery this holding that's bigger from and yet we're asked to speak from within it and i love the richness that's coming forward i just want to say that to everybody that's uh, that's shared tonight and in your silence for you know if you haven't come forward like the richness in all of that right and so that's part of the work of this this gathering is is to move from a position of poverty in the world, in our individual life, in our cultural life, in our ecological life at the moment, into a greater richness. What does that look like? And, you know, and, 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 and let's start with our speech. Let's start with our language team. Let's start with all the sharing. I'm hearing richness. Very happy about that. Catherine. Thanks. I think um, something that I've been reflecting on throughout this conversation is just how we can know um, when we are within and when we are about. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of work in two different worlds. One is academic and one is in a space of sort of strategic learning with people who are trying to make systemic change. And reflecting on what Perrin was saying, in academia, when we have critiques, it is often about just kind of how, how clever can you be in finding something that's wrong um, and pointing that out and and trying to, uh, you know, say something very brilliant. <laughs> uh, I find that critiques often kind of have that feel. Whereas in um, the consultant space, it's all about, well, what what is the most important thing that we need to learn in order to act in a way um, that makes more sense and is going to have a, a greater impact? So, and within that also, I think there's, space made for a kind of more act to know mentality but I find it challenging sometimes to know when I am about and when I am within <laughs> right now I'm writing this dissertation that is lots of it is about all of these practices um, that communities are are creating um, to live in more sustainable and more healthful ways and often when I write about them I feel very within even though my role is, um, kind of inherently without as a, or not without, but about, um, as a researcher. And so, I don't know, no answers, but just thoughts <laughs> on that distinction. It's, it's a great question. Um, how do we know when we're about or we're within? I'll just share this comes up in many different ways. And I think I'd really like to hear Andy's thoughts on this because this feels, this goes back to the difference between the pragmatic and the aesthetic as a distinction. Um, you know, we could have long conversations. Uh, Andy could lead us in long conversations on the notion of this question, like what is art? But uh, in the broader notion of what is aesthetic, which goes to what Perrin was saying too, I, I like the aesthetic position because it holds both art and design, right? But this, this, this broader notion, but it also holds other things. It holds the nature of the, the form of our relationship. If Eric was here as, an, as still with us uh, as an osteopath, he would talk about working with form. But I, I had this lovely, I remember my, my mentor, Brad Keeney, who we've spoken about um, uh, once told me, and, and um, it was a lovely uh, sharing that we had. And he said, listen, uh, this is related to uh, sort of psychotherapy work or healing work or working with people. He said, listen, when, when, when something really has happened, when something transformative has come about, when there is a change in movement into the greater whole, into this broader aesthetic that holds us, um, this place of transformation, and and the space that that is, like the the, the texture, the space, the it's and, and the t the time of it, it's not the chronological. It's that world of Kairos where it is shifting and morphing and, and moving. He says, when something happens in that moment that is truly transformational, not back to Olga's trickster, uh, not just a blowing up of the ego or a great idea or, you know, a solution or whatever, but something that's truly transformational. We've become something else. Change has happened. In the interactional sense, if it's happened, we all know that it's happened. And we don't have to look at the other and say, did it happen? 
Did, did that, was that good for you? Did that change happen? Do you, isn't that a great idea? Uh, don't you think this will be a wonderful project? Like there, there is none of that needed. Um, there is this moment that when we, when we're in it and that's it, we're in it when we're in it, it's an immersion experience, like the sea. Like we both know we're in it. We're both in the ocean of this transformation and change in this moment. And it's kinesthetic and it's embodied and it's sensual. And I tell my patients often, it's my goosebump meter. I get goosebumps. I'm like, oh, I've got goosebumps. I've got goosebumps. People think that it's the craziest thing I say. Like, they're like, why do you keep telling me you got goosebumps? And then I explode. Well, I said, I don't have a CT scanner, but I've got this body and it gets goosebumps. <laughs> and I think we're in a goosebump moment, you know, and, 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 um, I don't know. That's not that your question is a beautiful question, Catherine. It, it shouldn't have one answer. That's just one story that came up out of me in this moment to that beautiful question that will have many, many answers. How do we know if we're about or within? The one other little point I would say is don't try too hard to be within. You'll push it away. It's one of those paradoxes. The harder you try to be within, the more you'll end out and about. Right? So there's this letting go uh, less than detaching from right and these are perennial quintessential notions of um or you could go the other way of you know letting the room you know the, the room and the container getting bigger heating it up moving forward and you know there, there's there's all different ways that we can come into this but um yeah i don't know how does that feel does that does that resonate at all feel free to unmute Catherine, if you want to throw a um, no, it's yeah, that it definitely resonates. And I think, yeah, when like in the dichotomy of about and within, it's sort of clear which one is desirable, <laughs> right? Like, mo I know that there is an obvious role for about, um, especially in the world of objective science, which we do want to have. It brings certainly value to our society. But I think in our lives, we kind of want to be within. And so um, what you said around, you know, don't try too hard to be within because it will push it away. I think that is important. There's one other notion to the opposite, right? Which is when within happens, we and we all know it and we all feel it and we all know it, right? It's resonant. Like you said, it's resonant. It's coherent. Uh, it's, it's unified. We're in the whole. We know it. We know it. We deeply know it with certainty. There's a certitude. And likewise, when we're in a bout and we're pretending we're within, there's a stinkiness, right? And you, you mentioned it, right? Like that whole sort of look how brilliant I am or, um, you know, see me over here or I'm going to put you down to raise me up or false humilities. Like there's a stink with it. There's a stink with it. And uh, it's good to be aware of both of those differences because we'll all fall into them right? With all, all humility, we'll fall into the stink at times and, and we'll fall into the shared resonance and coherence, you know, that's very different than that dissonance. And, and, but I, I would say, trust the felt, trust the felt, trust the embodied. Andy, do you have a jump in? And I see, I, 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 uh, I, I yeah. I thought, you, I thought you said it beautifully, Bill. Um, and I, I, I yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely trust the body's um, reactionary process. Like, you know, the goosebump <laughs> is a is a is a good indicator. Um, but so are tears, and uh, so is laughter. Um, also, are good physiological um, expressions of shifts of, of of you know changes that are, are occurring. Um, and I think that's often um, what it is that you're looking for. And I think just from being in education, we always, you know, we in as a, as a teacher, you're always struggling with this idea that you tell your students, you know what they need to know in order to, to, to learn or to, you know, to do whatever. Um, but the truth is that we don't know what their gifts are and we don't, and they may not know them either. And we don't know what best way to serve those gifts. Um, and we don't know if, if, if um, passing them or failing them or pushing them or pulling them or, you know, giving them struggles or giving them breaks or it doesn't, we don't have any clue what is necessary in order to create um 
some kind of outcome that everyone is looking for. But if we are listening all the time for those feelings, then they will show themselves to us um, in the most unexpected ways. And that is that kind of um, being willing to accept that I don't really understand the, the big picture, um, but that, I, that, I, that I'm going to give my attention, full attention to those parts. Um, not because I care so much that, 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 that there's all of these parts, but because if, I, if, I'm, if I'm listening to them, then the, the larger stuff will, will show itself. And when it shows itself, like Bill said, everyone knows and everyone's there and, and, and <laughs> surprise, surprise, my stuff magically happens. Yeah. And, I, you know, if you, if you can write so that you're, if you can live so that you're about always births within and if you're within, it's always birthing you're about, then <laughs> that's, I don't know, that seems like the perfect mix of it, but and somewhere in the middle of that, you have to abandon, as Bill says, the entire conceptual idea that those are things that you are attempting to do, because that will just ruin the process. Sean, I haven't heard from you yet today. I see a hand there. Oh, there he is. The hello, real hello. Sean, the real, the real sea arc right there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the question, I mean, I'm thinking back to the questions here. I think one of them was, I mean, and, and you, Bill, you, you made a, a shift in, in reef, saying a, a question differently, asking what, what brought us here tonight. And I, I, I felt, I liked that, um, that question because I could really connect actually with, with, with my own body tonight, which, uh, as you might, one might infer from seeing, uh, my vertical, sorry, my horizontal position, uh, that I'm in, uh, some degree of discomfort. And as both, you know, I struggle with, uh, chronic pain. And uh, tonight's not a particularly good night, and um, and so there was a sense of being coming on the call and listening, and being, even though it's you know been an hour, almost two hours of, of listening, still feeling like I'm able to. I've been participating um, with. And my pain's with me here in this participating. Um, because while really I, the drugs have stopped working and there's nowhere else to go. Um, and even though, I mean, there's been no, uh, I mean, this is sort of the opposite of anesthesia. This is anesthesia. <laughs> um, that... Um, at the very least, I, I felt that here's a place uh, uh, coming to a well, right, where I sense there's a, something going on, right, that can, can speak to that, that wholeness that will include being within this painful body. Um, and I mean, something that just kind of struck me was it was a couple of minutes ago um that felt good in my body was uh a shift in you bill you i think it was when you started talking about your goosebumps um your voice changed um your energy change like your uh your enthusiasm it's 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 like you kind of you kind of softened into the into the conversation in a way that was different from the beginning. I remember you mentioned your nervous your nervous cough, and I know the feeling. 
because as an educator, I live it every week. And um, I think there's something about the, the, the movements that like, it's not kind of an on or off switch, right? That like, we kind of come in and out and dance in and out and in and out. And, and then there's some deepening and then some shallowing and then some de- even further deepening. Um, it's not like you can go from zero to a hundred. Um, and that, I don't know, there was, I guess, at least in that, in that moment in, in, in seeing you and hearing your voice, it was kind of like, oh yeah, that's a part of, that's a part of Bill that I, that I, that I know that's here now. And, and it, it's, it's something that I really enjoy about about you that you bring into uh, into conversation and uh, I, I welcome I, I welcome it as much as I welcome all of the other parts I really appreciate that Sean thank you you know I, I appreciate um, in, in some ways this ties into what Catherine was saying and, uh, and the threads through all of our conversations there's something about being seen I think the, you know, we think the, the about, you know, the about claims to see things, right? It claims this great observership, this power of observership, but it sees nothing. But when you saw me from within, the double within, you know, within this conversation, within our, our history, uh, within myself, you know, um, it's good to be seen. And likewise, I just want to say I, I appreciate your modeling to us tonight um, from within uh from with you know the, the, again people you you understand it i know um the paradox that you can model a softness from your struggle um and that's so again we're here to teach ourselves what within looks like you know in all of those different forms and i'm just so appreciative and just so grateful that uh, uh people are are, are are speaking from I'm going to use the word authentic, you know, from the, because within authentic lives within Uh, authentic lives close to risk and vulnerability and all of these other things. And so I'm very much appreciative, very much appreciative. And I know we're getting close to the time and I see the two hands and I don't know if they were up from previous or if they're new, I see Perrin still has the hand and Aaron, um, do you guys have any last sort of comments or reflections and as a, as a a wrapping up and, and of this circle? I, I will say something um, that sort of ties together um, all of the conversation that just, you know, happened over the past few comments, um, just kind of based on this idea of being kind of within and without. Um, and it, it kind of relates to Catherine's research, too. I think there's, um, you know, there's sort of this question as to whether there's a responsibility on the part of the community and the system to enable health or wholeness for the individual. Right. And I think um and I think, you know, like when we're, when we're within the system, a lot of times, you know, like we're actually changing parts of ourselves to kind of, especially, you know, like within kind of an industrialized system, we're changing parts of ourselves to be uncomfortable in different ways and kind of fit, you know, the scripts that are expected of us. Um, and I think, you know, again, sort of the question would be um, if, if we should be thinking about, you know, kind of shifting the system to enable wholeness and as, you know, sort of the last comment was sort of suggesting bring out, um, you know, the best in each other, really. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and in our own small way, right. Just, just in our lo- own sort of, I, I am a real deep believer. I've got a new faith that has come about. It went, it's part, it, it goes back to the about to within transformation. When I stopped being an about person this year and realized I was a within person, and I said, it, it's new still, it's fresh, new car smell on me still. Um, when that happened, I, I developed a new faith, the faith in self-organization. So it wasn't just a word about an abstraction. I could give you the definition of self-organization, but all of a sudden it became, I'm like, oh, no, I believe in it. I believe that with all the things going on in the world right now, with all the pull towards this nihilistic, um, you know, you know, this sort of this communal group nihilistic position, you know, and the despair that comes from it. I believe in self-organization. And so I think that, you know, these, these endeavors of us talking and sharing, you know, these local, it's 
let's call it local and I, although it's the internet and it's expanded, but this as a group, we're meeting in this local way. Um, I believe that's part of the, you know, the mystery of, of this thing called health. And, uh, and I think your words echo that Aaron, you're, you're going to, you're going to close us off here. So you're going to, I, I want to, so let's, uh, no, no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just really love what um, Andrew said earlier about, and a couple of other people brought up, you know, I was really happy, like uh, this, this felt sense, this shifting happening in your body that you can feel when people are sharing different things. Um, and Sean, when he started talking about chronic pain, I like immediately, like I cued in. I was like, I can hear him now. Like, it's not difficult to listen to. It's easy because there's something that's coming out and it's not flat. There, there's something and it's, it's doing something. And it, um, the, the feeling or the sense I kind of get is, is cracking open, but I don't want to use that in a way that makes it sound like whatever was there before is bad, but it, 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 um, it is like pushing open space or room for possibility for things to flow between whatever nine squares of this organism we have here. Um, and, um, that's exciting. And, and I feel it in my body as energy. And I I've had like no sleep the past three nights and I worked a long day today and I don't have a lot of energy, now, but I feel it in my body as energy. And, um, and when I think of health, I think of energy and having energy. Um, so that's all I got. And I hope Catherine, you hear another answer to your question, right? About and within, how do we know it? And, 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 and in Aaron's description, right? Like when he's, uh, if you never said, I'm feeling this energy and vitality, despite my, you know, fatigue, we'd all know that he's got feeling and energy and vitality. You know, you, you can, it's, it's there, it's resonant and it's bringing out that energy and vitality. I think it's a lovely note um, that we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here and um, that, you know, too, that we're going to leave with this, this resonance, this coherence, this energy, this vitality. And the paradox that that's in the mix of our pain, our struggle, our fatigue, our uncertainty, the tensions we hold, the, the difficult answers that have not come to the holding of the question, that is all right here in the mix of it. I do I'm gonna, I want to leave a couple of minutes for Andy to, to wrap us up and to take us out, but I just want to ask of everybody, and it, it, I hope, again, I'm going to ask it from within rather than about this community success is going to lay in that we bring the diversity of voices into this conversation. It's actually the only thing that matters. Um, it's the only thing that matters. And so, you know, as you reach out where we are, this wonderful symmetrical square of nine here at the end. Um, but there's other beautiful symmetrical numbers and, uh, and, we, and, and let's bring them into the conversation. I, I know, uh, Alex, you brought in Aaron today, right? That was, I think I remember saying, yeah, when, when we, we left you in the waiting room. I forgot, Aaron's forgotten in the waiting room. I get a note from Alex. <laughs> My friend is here. Um, you know, bring the other people into these conversations. I'm so glad the new voices showed up. Um, Perrin, you're our last of the new voices. So glad to hear your voice today. So glad that the return, and, and let me, the gratitude for those that have been with us from the beginning and, and through. Um, you know, this, this is how this conversation builds. So just very, very grateful. Um, Andy, our last thoughts to wrap up the evening. In. Okay, just before I came in, I grabbed um, Walt Whitman, uh, Laws for Creation. Do you take it, I would astonish? Does the daylight astonish? Or the early red start twittering through the woods? Do I astonish more than they? This hour, I tell things in confidence. I might not tell everybody, but I will tell you. Who goes there? Hankering, gross, mystical, nude. How is it that I extract strength from the beef I eat? What am I? And what are you? All I mark is my own. You shall offset it with your own. Else it were time lost listening to me. Shall I pray? Shall I venerate and be ceremonious? I have pried through the strata 
and analyzed to a hair and counseled with doctors and calculated close and found no sweeter fat than sticks to my own bones. In all people, I see myself, none more and not one a barley corn less. And the good or bad I say of myself, I say of them. <laughs> I am solid and sound. <laughs> Until next week, guys. Thank you all Thanks so much, much for being here. And I'll end the recording with that. Thank you, guys. <laughs>